Welcome, you AWS advocates. This is Michael Forrester with Code Cloud. Hi, welcome. We are doing a combined November and December of 2023, Keeping Up with AWS. We're going to be talking about 16 significant announcements that have come out pretty much since early November, right before reInvent, right around reInvent, and then all of the stuff that happened in December, which was pretty much just as busy as reInvent. So we're going to talk about the 16 most significant things in 8 November, 8 December that happened during that time. We're going to talk about the release of DB2 as a new RDS engine. We're going to talk about a bunch of enhancements to Code Catalyst and to Amazon Q, which is their kind of new generative AI assistant that they're throwing out there. We're going to talk about improvements to ECS and a ton of the other services inside of AWS. Let's dive in. So, hey, if you like this channel, just a reminder, like, subscribe, go ahead and let us know in the comments what it is that you want. Otherwise, let's dive in. Okay, here we are. Number one, November 2023. Let's talk about keeping up with AWS. Okay, so a couple of things is, as you probably noticed, our updates have been geared more and more towards DevOps, but particularly about the intersection between AI and DevOps. We're not going to get off the DevOps train, but we want you to know that our tidbits are kind of slotted towards that topic, right? Code Cloud, this is what we do, right? Number one. Amazon has now announced basically capacity blocks for machine learning purposes. So you may remember their old product called Elastic Inference. This allowed you to attach GPUs basically to your instances in order to use for machine learning workloads. Well, now you can reserve GPU compute capacity for short duration workloads. So kind of think of it as it's almost like reservations, but it's like low cost GPU compute instead of CPU compute. And it basically allows you to scale to hundreds of NVIDIA jobs, like the GPU jobs. So every month you're gonna be updating your model that you use for let's say sales predictions. And you know it's gonna take four hours and it's gonna take a thousand NVIDIA GPUs. You can now use capacity blocks for ML to reserve that capacity every month, get that capacity, run your job and get it at a lower cost than you would if you were just playing retail price. That's number one for November. Number two for November is that local stack and CDK have been put together for this example repo for infrastructure as code. So basically this example repo is going to showcase the usage of local stack and the CDK to address specific integration challenges where the end target is a deployment on an AWS platform. If you're not familiar with local stack, by the way, it's really helpful, particularly when you're doing infrastructure as code. It basically allows you to kind of mimic the AWS endpoints and environment on your local environment. Obviously you don't get like full capacity, but it mimics the responses. So that's number two. Take a look at this repo. If, you, if you're not familiar with local stack and you want to see the CDK integration. Mode. Number three for November, Code Build now supports Lambda to build and test. Now, before Code Build would allow you to build a pipeline, right? Like a CI CD pipeline with certain steps in it, and you could easily use EC2. You could use containers. You could actually use Lambda, but you had to write your own kind of custom build step for that. Well, now that's shifted, Code Build now allows you for you to just call Lambda has a inherent native call instead of having to do a custom call. So now it's a much easier process now for you to, to call Lambda to do your builds, to run your tests, to run your static code analysis, to invoke other services. So that's number three for November. Number four is that there's this great post that talks about how to take AWS's Lattice and API Gateway and basically how to blend the two together to secure containers that are acting as the API Gateway endpoints for all of your API calls that are going into the API Gateway. So it allows, Lattice allows basically for encrypted end-to-end -end communications between these disparate services. This is a must read if you're not familiar with it. Lattice is a relatively new service, and this is a great way to understand a very specific use case for Lattice. And this, by the way, from a DevOps perspective, is the SEC in DevSecOps. So if you haven't seen Lattice yet, take a look at it because it's going to solve a lot of security problems in your infrastructure and security needs as it relates to AWS and the integration of services and how they talk to each other. Okay, take a look at it. Number five for November is now we can provision using Terraform in Code Catalyst. So Code Catalyst is interesting because you were required before to do some custom action scripting in order to use Terraform within a Code Catalyst workflow. But now there's a native action, kind of similar to how there's now a native Lambda action inside of Code Build, where you can basically use Terraform as one of the action like build steps, if you will, within the workflow in question. If you haven't checked out Code Catalyst, by the way, this is a great way to get started. You're going to see a lot more of Code Catalyst, more and more and more show up in DevOps updates. 
Number six for November. And I know this is going to be weird because I'm going to talk about a database technology, but you all know, I all know you sysadmins, SREs, DevOps people out there. I know that you're having to support databases. Now, our preference is that we love, absolutely love running our stateless containers at scale on Kubernetes. And if we have good operators, we'll run our databases. But if you're in a cloud provider, there's really no reason not to use the managed service to run the data and let all those concerns like scaling and all that just be handled by the service provider and keep your custom application inside ECS or EKS, depending on what you're using. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can now create active, active MySQL clusters, setting up active, active replication using our RDS for MySQL. So before you had to do that on your own EC2 instances, which means you had to manage them, you had to patch them, you had to do the whole kit and caboodle. RDS abstracts a lot of that away so that you don't have to worry about necessarily setting up the deep details around backups, the deep details around replication, the deep details around patching the operating system or even patching the engine. RDS handles all that for you. So now with active active MySQL clusters, instead of having to run your own EC2 instances and managing all that extra work, you can now just run that in RDS. So that's number six for November. Number seven, and this is an announcement that came out of reInvent in November, December, 2023. And this is a huge deal. So please take this in and dive into this, that EKS announced, the Elastic Community Service announced that they're actually going to allow you to assign EC2 security groups, right? And permissions to a pod identity service. And this simplifies pod permissions like you wouldn't believe, because not only do you now have networking firewalls around specific pods, again, we've had that for a second, right? But now you've got IAM permissions. So imagine that now, instead of having to embed credentials inside your container and pull it down through secrets or whatever, it's now just assigned as part of your build and deployment process to the environment. So it's in this case to the pod in question. So then that way there's no credentialing that can be exposed, hacked, or otherwise found inside the container or the pod itself, right? Now the pod, the environment, actually has the permissions content. So you can now set a pod to say, look, you can talk to DynamoDB and you can read and write against this specific database and you can read against this database and you can go talk to this Redshift cluster. This is what number seven, the EKS pod identity is gonna simplify pod permissions. Keep an eye on this, especially if you're running the Elastic's Kubernetes service, which I hope you are, because most of us running Kubernetes are actually using a managed Kubernetes, right? This is a game changer. If you haven't looked at this already, dive into it. Last but not least for November, just a reminder that the sources for all this information from AWS is down at the bottom. Number eight is that Code Whisper is now gonna offer like a more powerful AI assistance when your infrastructure is code. So Code Whisper, which is Amazon's kind of like co-pilots, the AI assistance for your IDE and command line is now offering general availability of Code Whisper as of November. And it is even more powerful and more slated toward things like CloudFormation, the CDK, not so much Terraform, but it's getting there, right? We've got other tools for that. So those are the tidbits for November, all eight of those. Let's roll over to the ones for December. Okay, so that was November, right? Reinvent was at the end of that, and then we had December with Christmas, all this stuff. What happened in December? Let's talk about December. Okay, so a couple of cool things. Now, some of these, by the way, blend in a little bit of late November. One or two of these was at the beginning of January. There was just a kind of a stretch of time there where everybody just stopped talking. So some things got posted late, not by us, by Amazon. Right? Okay, so let's talk about it. So number one is there. there is now this thing called Zonal Shift, and it works with the Route 53 application discovery controller. If you're not familiar with this, this is an active kind of DNS monitor, if you will, that allows you to really control where your application traffic is going via DNS. So what you, you can do now is that DNS will actually detect, let's say you're in US East 1, which is Virginia, and you're using one of the six data centers there. If one of those zones goes down, this zonal shifts a feature of the application discovery controller will shift all of the traffic away from the failed zone. So literally your customers can avoid seeing any potential failures that come online, let's say because you're having a problem or maybe even AWS is having some kind of problem. So zonal shift is a way to automatically shift traffic away from a failing zone. That's number one for December. Check it out if you haven't seen this. Could be a game changer. Number two, this is a big deal, is that ECS, the Elastic Container Service, which has supported ephemeral storage, I believe up to 200 gigabytes, right? Meaning that if the task or the container goes away, the storage goes away, right? 
It supports persistent storage with EFS, which is like an NFS you know, network file service. You can share that with other services if you want to, but it has never natively supported persistent volumes, namely EBS. Well, guess what? Now you can mount EBS volumes inside your task, inside your containers for ECS, and this gives you persistent storage. That's a game changer, right? Because this now paves the way for high performance items such as ETL, databases. Again, we might still be looking at externalizing some of these apps to cloud services, but what if you want to deploy it all in one place? You don't want your database to be actually in a cloud service. You want to deploy it in a container. Now there's an option, okay? That's number two. Number three. RDS now supports DB2 as another SQL engine type. And I am shocked, frankly. I'm completely shocked. I mean, you know, when they came out with MySQL and MariaDB, and then they came out with Postgres, that made total sense. Open source databases makes total sense. MSSQL, Oracle, like the Microsoft's SQL server and Oracle, those also make sense because they're very popular, right? I didn't realize it, but DB2 apparently is very popular with a lot of Amazon's customers. And so as of December of 2023, they've added that in as an option. So you can now get DB2 as another engine type inside of RDS. Who knew? Right. But good for us, right? Because now we're not having to roll DB2 out into containers or into our own EC2 instances. RDS is an option if it supports the features you need, right? Number four, AWS launches a new region. This is in Calgary, it's West Canada, right? Groundbreaking for DevOps, right? Nah, not really. But I mean, how great that now if you have Canadian customers in Calgary, you can now co-locate the applications closer to your end users, maybe you know, the Canadian government or customers in that region. Regardless, you should be aware of new launches and new locations, especially if you are a global SRE, a global DevOps serving customers worldwide. Number five, okay, so now you can use Data Yes's Application Composer like directly inside of your IDE to visually build modern applications and basically develop your infrastructure's code templates using Code Whisperer. So this is an interesting thing because it integrates with your IDE and we'll do a deeper video on this, but basically what it does is it allows you to drag and drop components onto a field and it will actually create infrastructure's code templates for you. And Application Composer is a pretty new product, pretty interesting, but we'll do a deeper dive video. But meanwhile, if you can't wait for us, go ahead and dive into that. Because if you're looking for a way to visualize and maybe have 50 to 80% of your infrastructure's code templates pre-created for you in your IDE using some of the new AI generative tools, this is the way to get there. Okay. Number six, you probably may not be aware but Amazon released Amazon Q, right? AWS released Amazon Q, right? Which is basically a generative AI interactive assistant, very kind of similar to PT. It basically allows you to integrate Amazon Q into your Code Whisperer experience, into your ID experience. So you can go from a, an idea, basically from a few natural language inputs to like generated code. Like I want a website that receives, you know, customer profiles and processes them and it has a membership and, you know, I want to be able to process credit cards and we offer video on demand, right? Try it. You'd be shocked at how close it gets. It's not hundred percent yet because nothing in generative AI is hundred percent yet. Not yet, but this is like year two, right? Let's get into this thing. But you're starting to see the broad strokes of where we're headed, where human beings are now partnering with these AI tools to not remove the human element, but to have the human element go faster, right? To get that second perspective that is a little bit more logical, lean, and evaluative, right? So check it out. Okay, so this is significant. Much like RDS announcing that there's a DB2 instance, they have released a new storage class for S3. It's called S3 Express One Zone, and it is fast. It is way faster faster than the standard S3. And you know, they came up to 10 times performance. I mean, I saw five to seven times the performance on files in which I knew the previous like standard performance of, right? It is a great fit for when your data is hot and you need to download it faster. Maybe you're running a web server that needs to like have you know, better backend access. I just can't believe they launched another storage class. I mean, we've got intelligent tiering, we've got you know, flexible retrieval, we've got deep archive, we've got instant retrieval. Now we've got the, you know, the infrequent access one zone, we've got infrequent access. Now we've got S3 standard, we've got intelligent tiering, and now we've got S3 express one zone, the fastest of all the storages. All right, number eight. And here, number eight is near and dear to my heart, not because it's a brand new service, not because somehow this is gonna change the world, but I wanna throw this concept out at you is that back Backups are useless. Restores are the only thing that matter. It doesn't matter if you back it up if you've never test restored it. Your backup is only as good as your most recent restoration. Now, in AWS Backup, you can actually automate restore testing and validation 
You can have an automatic process where it basically goes and restores it, tests it, looks for a certain set of data, and then deletes the test. Imagine those database backups that you have, and you don't actually know if they're gonna work. I mean, we like to think they work, right? We don't know, because we haven't restored them. Now you can do that automatically. There is some mention, by the way, in the original article about using the backups and automation to re restore, like in the face of like ransomware and stuff. I would think that would probably be a little bit more of a manual process, but I'm not knocking automation. If you can automate that, great. But number eight, you can now automate your restores and restore testing using AWS Backup. It's amazing. Once again, we've got all the sources listed down at the bottom. This is the combined for November and December. I hope you liked it. We're gonna do keep on going with January, February, March, et cetera, for 2024. My name is Michael Forrester. I'm with CodeCloud. Like, subscribe, let us know what you want. And if you wanna see something in particular, let us know. Otherwise, you'll see me following up on a couple of these with a deeper dive into certain aspects of these announcements from reInvent, all right? Have a good one. Take care.